over to you, Todd. Um, thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. So we can talk about sanctification and knowledge, but we're going to talk about it maybe through an indirect way. Cool. Um, before we start, is there anything on your mind that you'd like to maybe talk about instead? That would be better? Or more pressing? Any weird questions floating around your head? <laughs> making you want to do something you shouldn't? <laughs> can you write your last name? My last name? Can you interpret that now? Is it for us in the back? <laughs> M C L A U C H L I N? That was not a very good marker, is it? <laughs> now it gets erased. Well, there's some more down there, too. Yeah, go ahead and erase it. Is that good? All right. I used to spell it with a G, and then I. Yeah. That's the common way of spelling it. Yeah. Not Lachlan. 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 Yeah. So, uh, nothing on your mind at all? Any questions that's pressing that we can weave in, maybe? Give us one. What's the most, what's the most critical one? Meet your phone. Well, it's not the alarm of sanctification. Okay. It's how we reach that change within ourselves, because it's not by our own work. I remember okay. last time you came to it was offer up a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Lord, what do you want me to do? Mm-hmm. Follow through with that, and then come to the gift. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to come change. Okay, we'll talk about that. Also, you teach us patterns. So help us with the patterns on how to, uh, to pierce the veil in this line. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> My husband's in heaven, mm-hmm. and I'm interested because through the gift of discernment and hearing him, he talks about sanctification. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, you're talking about this. So mm-hmm. I'm so excited to hear, what does that mean? What are the ramifications? What is, why is that so important that that would be one of the messages that he felt so important that the Lord and the process of sanctification is so personal? Okay. Okay. I'm calculating in my head. <laughs> Mine's probably off the wall, but... Anybody else? Between <laughs> 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 sanctification and prosperity, it seems like oh. we should be able to have. I mean, prosperity in like like monetary wealth or prosperity in well, blessing. being sanctified and blessed, but also being able to afford living. Because I don't think that we're supposed to sacrifice the house to. Oh, okay. Sanctified. I see what you're saying. There's certain things that we are necessary. Yeah. How do we focus on the finger while still visiting? While still getting sanctified and doing doing work. Okay. I know it's there. I just... Oh, no. This is, these are great I questions. I'm just mapping in my head how we should do this. We're going to go... Boop, 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 boop. And I was just thinking about sanctification with the recent conference. All on the temple, and then uh-huh. I recently returned from Israel and seeing all the mitzvahs or the purification mm-hmm. things, and then what we do in our temple. So, if, okay. I don't know if you're covering how that all ties in. I'd love to learn more. Okay. Thinking of which vector we're going to come at this time. <laughs> um, there's two different ways of approaching this that I think we can do. And if you don't mind, what we'll do is we'll actually we'll drive towards all these answers <coughs> through a path that may not look direct, but it's going to play, a, I think, a foundation for it. That's okay. I kind of want to present two ideas that are a little bit uncoordinated, so I don't want this to feel too... Over the place. I want to introduce one idea. I'm afraid if I do this, it's going to take us off for the rest of the time. <laughs> then I want to get another idea that I think in these two things will converge in a way that will be helpful. Um, there's the gospel is sort of like if you're the more you learn, I'm sure this is your experience, the more you learn, the more you realize that principles can have incredible depth 
and incredible simplicity, right? And it's when you kind of capture, when you can kind of see how both the simplicity and the simpleness and the depth, that's when you kind of know you're, you're getting comprehension to a principle, right? So what I want to do is, is take something that has incredible depth and start to collapse it in something very, very simple that you can use to do some of these things that we want to do. So call it like the Wednesday morning rule. Like, what do you do on a Wednesday morning? Like, sure, this is great to learn, but how does this affect me tomorrow morning when I get up in the morning? What do I do? So <clears throat> I'm so hesitant to start this because I don't want to do this a lot, but I want to, I want to lay this out and then we'll get into something else. You can think about possibly, let's call this like our progress, our progress, ascension, growing, increasing, becoming more godlike, whatever you want to, however you want to think about this. Let's, let's call this just going up, okay? And I think everybody here, or most people here, will probably think, in, think of this in terms of um, like something like sanctification. Justification, sanctification, calling the election made sure, sealing, that sort of route of going, increasing in your progression, right? And so one way to think about this is that that whole process of sanctification, everything is really, can be distilled down to one single thing, okay? And so this isn't going to make probably sense yet, but I want to kind of lay out what I want to get to. And if you understand that one single thing, this whole thing becomes really focused and really, really complicated, hard things that it feels like we're trying to go for and get become really, really focused on a Wednesday morning. Okay, so let me see if we can lay this out. So let's talk about um, justification, <laughs> sanctification, and stealing. And we're going to call this a born again or emission. This is, um, we'll split that sanctification category. We'll call this a straight and narrow path. And this are the various ceilings that we get from ourselves, to our marriages, design. Okay. So justification, like this is half of the half of our learning, you know, we've talked about in the past here, like half of our learning is sort of like unlearning. Or like I found myself like ninety percent of my learning is unlearning something I believe to be true, to have to get unwound in order for the true thing to sort of like take root and go. And why that's hard is because we come, we, we belong to a church that we call a restored church, a true church, in a restoration 200 years in, where we are not supposed to have a perspective of how we think about doctrine could be in any way not sufficient because we're 200 years into our restoration. So right there, and this might get someone's heart rate up immediately, it might put you into sort of a blocker or resistance mode, like, wait a second, the way I've been thinking about this my whole life is unhelpful? And it's like, well, yeah, because if you're, if you're later in life and you haven't obtained basic experiences that the scriptures outline, you got to you got to zoom out a little bit and say, hey, what's going on? And so what I want to do is not invalidate our tradition. I just want to say, hey, maybe we, we take a step back and we just look at it and we just dial it in better. And we think about the principles and we just get more clear and we untie false traditions without throwing it all away, right? So we don't we're not we're not throwing anything away. We're not saying this is apostate or this is this is that and this is that and let's go move on to over here. It's zooming out and making sure that 
the way we understand things is more and more precisely in the order of truth. Because if we exercise faith in anything that's untruthful or distorted in any degree, it will distort your faith and you won't be productive in that faith. Okay, so but having said that, let's start with justification. So this is the idea of, of your baptism. This is the idea of your repentance. This is the idea of becoming born again. This is a topic that's been talked about here quite a bit, right? Right, I think? So we're going to untie something immediately. And do you mind if I just go like head on into this? Do you no. trust me that I'm not trying to lead you out of the church? <laughs> it's not yeah. some like secret argument I'm going to like set you up for and like, ah, they're all leaving. Because <laughs> um, I want to hit this head on, okay? Because this is probably, if you're to catalog the false ways we think about things that keep us from not moving forward, this might be in the top one, two, or three. And that is, your repentance is not checking boxes of basic covenant, uh, basic uh, commandment categories, like word of wisdom, chastity, going to church, stuff like that, and then getting into a vehicle that we call a covenant. So we think of covenants like vehicles, right? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make a covenant, and I'm going to get in this car, or I'm going to get in this train, or I'm going to get in this boat, and because I made this quote-unquote covenant, and I signed on the dotted line, that suddenly that, co- that covenant that I just signed, or that car I just got in, is going to take me to the celestial kingdom and to my eternal family, right? And then how I stay in that car or in that vehicle is I just do my best daily to not be as crappy of a person as I was the day before and build more faithful, and it's like this 1% better, and if I'm just continually in this improvement form, then this vehicle will work and take me to the celestial kingdom. None of this is true. None of it. It's not a thing. It doesn't exist. It, not only that, it's so untrue that if you really believe it, it will keep you from going to the celestial kingdom. That's the unlearning part, right? That's the unlearning part. The the That's what we've been taught. Yes. And remember in DNC 93, uh, 39, the evil one taketh away light and truth through disobedience and from the traditions of our fathers. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean that covenants are bad, or baptism is bad, or <laughs> repentance. We have never think it. Okay? This, I don't want to do this because it's not how it looks. Real. Okay, no, we got to do this. <laughs> okay. So, let's talk about what the true thing is. The true thing is something like, it's pretty rare in the scriptures that they say repent of a certain sin. Like sometimes in certain stories they'll say you need to repent of this or that. But repentance scripturally, and we'll, we'll, we'll just talk about uh, from a scriptural perspective of how this works. When, when it talks about repentance in the scriptures, it is not a micro thing, it's a macro thing. So it's like you repent when your entire mind and heart, and your being, and the purpose of your life, and your energy, and all that you are, is oriented completely to God. Now, you may have a real rough conception of God, and that's what I I want to talk about. But, and it's not only oriented, it's oriented in the sense of, and this is kind of one of the questions that can be asked to see how oriented is it, what am I willing to let go of and do in order to follow God with all that I have? And asking those types of questions will determine the level of sacrifice that you're in that will put you into communion or connection to God. Now, God is very, very gracious. And so he says things like, um, I think it's in DMT 45 where he says, and remember, um, the gift of the Holy Ghost is like the primary gift of God. So when he talks about the gifts of the Spirit, the gift of the Holy Ghost is like the primary one, right? He says, I give it to those who keep my commandments and to those who seek so to do. Okay, so this is a really gracious insight in the Scriptures, which is something like, our idea of perfection is really a Greek perfection idea, which is sort of a mathematical, like, everything has to add up and then, you know, everything has to be this sort of perfect structural thing, and it's, a, it's very behavioral, right? Our, our idea of perfection is a behavior perfection. 
it's a very Greek concept. It's not really what our scriptural language is Hebrew. And so you have to really um, kind of make that transition from a Greek way of looking at things, a Western, to a, a very Hebrew way. And the Hebrew way is this orientation through sacrifice. So this goes to this brother's, what's your name? Um, your, sac- your sacrifice question, right? So sacrifice is, boy, I want to get part one of the answer to your question, then we'll do part two at the very end, okay? Sacrifices can also become a stumbling block because, and it, I'm not sure this is quite you're getting at, but it's kind of a little bit of the spirit of, I think, what you were kind of touching on when I was listening to your question, is like, okay, then we become like aesthetics. We become like monks. Like, okay, if I'm going to follow God, I just have to like strip my, rip my clothes off and sell my house and go lay in the dirt and just, <laughs> just go, just go play, <laughs> in the dirt, you know? And it's not it. Um, because that's, that can also be just as much of a traditional deterrent of following God as um, other things. So, so when, we, when he says repent, because he says in two different places, in DNC 10 he says, my church are those, um, okay, I'm not getting the verse right, but my church are those who have repented. The church of Christ is those who have repented. Well, those who have repented, aren't we supposed to be repenting daily? Yeah, you are, but that's a, kind of a different way of thinking about it. The thing is, is like you haven't repented unless you've repented of all your sins. This isn't like a, let's kind of keep a catalog and work on my weaknesses, and we're just going to try to kind of <laughs> make awesome goals. Um, and it's not a bad thing, but it's not the thing that does it. It's not the thing that brings you into, into covenant, okay? Like, obviously, anything you're doing that's pushing towards light is going to be good. But this is more like, how do I really get light? Instead of like, in the twilight of light and darkness and huffing along and barely, you know, just trying to hold on. Okay, so repentance in the scriptures, if you really go back and look at it, this is why most of the scriptural examples of, of repentance, in, um, they get like kind of miraculous experiences and um, of change, of transformation, right? And one of our false traditions that has been propagated I hope you don't mind I'm talking this for bluntly because I'm, I'm probably a few people support the church more than I do. So when I do this, I do this with charity and like with the intent for like let's let's move forward and strengthen the church through true principles. Um, the other um, false tradition is something like the scriptures are a record of the outliers of miracles that are supposed to be like the big events that happen over hundreds of years that kind of get us excited, but they're not for the everyday member of the church that's supposed to be living quietly and humbly. As if the scriptures aren't humble, right? You get that, like, what's the normal humble Latter-day Saint? You're like, you don't think Alma the Younger, like, went through a form of humility? Anyway, I'll start soapboxing on this weird way we think about it. The scriptures are the patterns, they're not the outliers. They're the patterns. And when we start calling them outliers, it, it really does foment a spirit of disbelief in the scriptures and uninterest. Mm-hmm. Right? Why should I just go read about King Benjamin's people? They all get a fall on the ground or they all, you know, and have this big transformational experience. But for me, I just have to do my best, 1% every day, just 1%ing it. And hopefully by the time I'm 90 and doing genealogy work in the temple, something happens, you know, or I, I feel a little bit better. I don't, I don't know. I'm a little cynical. But, okay, so you, you repent in, in the pattern of the scripture. Who said patterns earlier? Yeah, patterns. So... I got it from you, okay? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, so go look in the scriptures and mind the patterns and, and don't look at them as outliers. They're not the special examples. They're the, they're the patterns. But also be careful. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to fall to the earth for three days and pass out. When you're born again, you have to look at what the real... Drive into what that pattern is. And let me give you a little hint on that particular pattern, the three days. If you're really wicked, and you're like on the verge of perdition, which Alma the Younger was, and you repent, you might pass out for three days, because the transformation delta <laughs> is a little is significant. But if you're like most people who are like in the church, really seeking and doing your best, and then you finally say one day, you know, I'm all in. I'm going all in, and I'm going to just break my heart with the Lord. You know, 
you, you, may not, you may not hear wrestling robes because that's not the actual pattern. The pattern is, is that you manifest the fullness of the fruits of the Spirit within you and you lose the desire for sin and you have the gift of the Holy Ghost and the, and the, and the gift of the Holy Ghost within you begin to manifest whether in all the different forms. Okay? So, justification is this complete repentant orientation. Okay? This is also... Uh, this is also the principle of the broken heart and contrite spirit is because the first thing that we're commanded to do in the gospel is perform sacrifices. It starts with Adam. Adam's the first thing he's told to do. All of existence, all of all structure of reality, all everything in the gospel that builds is on the singular principle of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the building principle of all of existence. From digging a ditch to lay plumbing pipe in your front yard to creating a world to a celestial marriage. Everything is based on sacrifice. Okay? Learning, learning the sacrifices associated with what's going to happen. Okay, just stop. Yeah? Sacrifice is the building what? Is the building principle, the fundamental principle of all hierarchical existence. You served a mission in Japan, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. So that's where I served my hand in Japan. That's cool. where we... We understand sacrifice a little bit oh. for some of them again, because cool. those people understand the law of sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know yeah. I was just remembering. I'm like, I think you understand oh, yeah. sacrifice because oh, that's cool. Where you Japanese go? really uh, understand yeah. that. So, yeah, oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Good for him. Where were you in Japan? Um, Okayama. Oh, cool. Nice. That's really cool. Where did you first? Nagoya. Just south of it. Did you say that one more time? Nagoya. Sacrifice is the. Uh, okay. <laughs> is the um, building principle of existence. So it's how, it's how you move every structure you're going to move into from moving dirt outside to taking care of kids to an eternal marriage to building Zion to creating world without end. It will always be upon the principle of sacrifice. And this is another rabbit hole we can go down. Sac- it's not, and you rarely ever, ever, ever declare your own sacrifices. It's whatever is administering to you from a higher level to a lower level will give you the sacrifice. They'll administer to you the sacrifice. So God commands his sacrifices. If you take your sacrifices, it kind of works a little bit, but not really. Like, you live on your mission when we were in the 90s. Did you do this on your mission? This is my friend Mark. He's in the back. Did your mission president do this thing where, like, okay, you, you set a goal, and then you figure out what sacrifice you're going to tell the Lord that you're going to do to get that goal? You ever did that? Our mission president is in another country. Oh. Uh, this is a kind of a common thing. My president, he was pretty enlightened. He didn't do this. Oh, I, I, I heard it all the time. And I taught the NGC, and they always talk about it. It's not, it doesn't really work. Like, unless the Lord's giving you the sacrifices. Like, and that's, that's a really powerful key. If you can get the sacrifices given to you, then you can make things happen. Otherwise, it's just brings spiritual ambition. Yeah. 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 That, that's, boy, that's like an hour to bake out that. <laughs> it really is, right? Because you're you're bringing into existence a vision of your own future, and that's usually a projection of your ego. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, the, Lord, the Lord will command the sacrifices. So if you want a blessing, you find out the sacrifice is associated with that blessing. Um, who mentioned veil? Did you mention veil? Uh, running the veil? Yeah. 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 The, the, pattern, the pattern, what, what is the pattern that we need to, to bring that veil? I know that if you read things in the but maybe I just don't fit the pattern. Well, the first thing is, is like, figure out which veil you want to rend. There's yeah. lots of them. Mm-hmm. And the second thing is, is figure out the one that's right in front of you, and then and then ask for the sacrifice to obtain. It's really simple. So, so we find you, the veil, the different veil. Um, okay, we, we start here. We start through every every level of, of ascension or, or spiritual transformation. It's the way to think about it. So go to Moses 6 is a good place that we can start here. Um, this is... Think about straight and narrow path, okay? Think about Lehi's dream. Lehi's dream is a great place to start, like, figuring out where veils are. So, the first veil you can kind of look at, if you look at the whole story, is Lynn and Lemuel, saying to Nephi, the Lord makes no such thing known unto us, right? He's like, arguing with Nephi, and Nephi's like, well, do you inquire? Where's the veil? We found a veil, right? Veil number one, God doesn't talk to me. <laughs> well, they're unbelief. Oh yeah, veils are always unbelievers. Uh-huh. Believe that you show them. Yeah, veils are always a veil. I shouldn't say always, because I don't know that. I think a lot of times you can look at a veil as almost, at least from my understanding, veils are always unbelievers. 
the veil of unbelief. Mm -hmm. So in the temple veil, what's right next to it? What sits right in front of the temple veil? The altar. So you stack sacrifices are always how you run veils. Don't want to go into it right now, but think in short of prayer. Think and start to identify where the sacrifices are in that. Okay? Because it's a sacrificial ceremony in one way of looking at it. So just let that marinate. Okay? That's okay. So you said to receive a blessing, you must have a sacrifice. Yeah. Okay. So a what, trial? Or, uh, yeah, so like, let's, let's, like, let's take the idea of sacrifice, because again, this is where our tradition starts to box us in and allow, allow the idea of sacrifice to become much more... Um, just be open to all the ways that sacrifices happen. So like... One sacrifice is, is, hey, God didn't tell me about this stuff, like Laman and Lemuel, and Nephi's what you inquired. Okay, well, what's the sacrifice offered up to get an answer to a prayer? Well, what does Romans 10, 3 through 5 say? Do you have real intent? Yes, yeah, you're right. Just your heart. Gotcha. If God tells you the answer, do you want to obey what he's about to tell you? That's a sacrifice. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. he won't tell you if, you're not, if you don't want to obey. That's another thing. Do you want to answer to a question? Do you want to obey the answer? And you better, you have to do that first. Mm -hmm. Because you, otherwise he won't open up to you. Aren't we invited to sacrifice all the time? I mean, I feel like the Spirit is always inviting me to change this or move forward yeah. in this or yeah. inquire more about this. Even on the way over mm -hmm. here, I was doing a voice memo. Okay, this summer I'm claiming this, this, and this because the Spirit's been inviting me to do it and I haven't done it yet. Like, yeah, exactly. aren't we continually being invited? It should be every day. You should, this is, the, this is the, the, the posture and the, like, uh, disposition of always being in a state of a broken heart and a contrary spirit. So, bro searching? Is that what that means? Yeah. Asking? Yeah, so let's build this out a little bit in context of what you're saying, okay? So, justification, I'm not avoiding, I really want to, I'm answering it through this, okay? So, we talk about being born again a lot. A lot of people in like minded communities and friends in the church, this is a big, big question. How do you become born again? How do you get the mighty change of heart, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's a perennial question. The answer is broken heart and contrite spirit, which is the sacrifice of the desires of your heart, um, the sacrifices of you willing to, to, to do anything, to give up anything in order to. It's the King Lomai, King Lomai, um, the King Lomai, yeah, yeah, who's like, I'll give up all my kingdom to know, you know, Anna says, mm -hmm. is that the same story? Yeah, 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 right? yeah it is, right? Yeah, I'm going to get wires crossed in my head. <laughs> Amazon says there's a God. If there's a God, I'll give up my kingdom. And all of a sudden, boom, he's born again, right? Because that was a legitimate thing he felt. Like, he's like, I'm not going to hold on to this kingdom. I'll give up all that I have. And that is, that's the key. That's the key. And if, you, and if you don't feel in your heart that you can, step back. Because the Lord says, I'll work with you in that. Because this is, so this is almost 32. And he says, you can't believe. Well, do you have a desire to believe? Can you even find a little desire to plant a seed? See how, see how like, gracious the Lord is in this process? Let's say you, you, I can't even bring myself to give a broken heart. Okay, well, do you have a desire to have a broken heart? Let's start with that. Let's plant that. Let's let that marinate. Let's feed that light. Let's give that ground to bury in, right? And let that grow. And then you grow into a place where you can let go, and you can let go, and you can let go, and you trust the Lord. The Spirit can come into you and soften your heart because the Spirit is always the softening agent. Right? You can't even break your own heart, which is really weird to think. You can't even break your own heart by taking thought. No man by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature, right? So I'm talking fast, but like, I just want to like get into territory. So uh, if you want to reference on that, 2 Nephi 2 is really good. This is where, Le this is where Nephi says, he's, he wants to know what his father had seen in the dream, and he says, and the Lord, did, the Lord did visit me and soften my heart so I could believe all the words of my father. How powerful is that? Like, you can... If you don't have a soft heart, if you don't have a broken heart, you can ask the Lord, say, will you soften my heart and lean into it? I always put the, um, the conditional statement in my prayers. I want to do this by my own free will and choice because sometimes you're like, you know, soften my heart. Give me some faith. And a train hits you out of nowhere, right? Like you just get clobbered. I like the idea of like, I'm going to pursue this by my own free will and choice. And don't, <laughs> Not compelled. don't just compel me. It's okay if you need to, but... Let's just try to do this by leaning into it, right? Okay, so justification is the condition of your spirit coming into communion with the spirit of the Lord. Justification, scriptures have some like economic 
um, metaphors. When we use a lot of meta economic, like balance the balance sheet, and God has like this sheet of do's and don'ts, and you have to like balance it right to get the law, the legal thing right. And it's okay, <laughs> obviously it's scriptural, but like it's okay to kind of think in terms of that, but it's actually kind of a thing that you have to kind of move past. In, that, in thinking about justification, because that can really kind of catch you up, and you make, it makes God feel really overly weirdly legalistic in how the universe is run, right? So, justification, let me, let me suggest something really fast and see if this, if this sticks with you, okay? Uh, so you're building this house. Well, um, I, built a, uh, I built a fireplace in my backyard out of brick, out of a cinder block. A big one that's like 10 feet tall, maybe 9 feet tall. Um, I had no business doing it, but with YouTube, all things can be done. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's pretty big. Like, it's, it's pretty, it's, it was way more ambitious than I had talent or capacity to do. So I'd like build like up to here, and this thing would be like leaning, right? Because I don't know anything what I'm doing, masonry work. Right? It's a huge learning curve. I got crap. I'm going to take this thing down. So I rip it all down and put it back up. And my wife is like, oh man, is this thing ever going to get done? Um, but I'm learning all these lessons, masonry. Put that anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, masonry, um, bringing that back into a justified structure, because it's not it's unjustified. It's leaning, right? So you're bringing it into a justified form. So it's 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 square. It's it's in its proper form, right? Your spirit has an eternal proper form to it. And when you come into this body, you're born into this world, and you know the seeds of death take hold, and you move into distorted structure in your spirit and you justification is when your spirit comes into a an alignment with the spirit of the Lord when you're in communion or you're in um, oh thanks you read my mind um, <laughs> that guy talks too fast he needs like this drink of water uh, so justification is when your spirit comes into an alignment with the spirit of the Lord okay? that's maybe just one putting that fireplace into an alignment Okay, I'm going to suggest something. This might be a false doctrine, so at some point you're like, he was so, didn't know he was talking about, but throw it away, but I'm going to suggest this to you. I think this is true, okay? This is the only thing you ever have to worry about, ever, is that singular thing, which makes this great, because, let's draw, like, well, sorry, let me explain what this is real quick, and then we can draw something. Once you're justified, you're in the gate, so to speak, in the doctrine of Christ. Okay, you're on the straight and narrow path. Why is it straight and narrow? Because you're in a justified state. Okay, your spirit is in a sanctified state or a justified state. Let's do that word. So you're on the path, and this is like when Nephi is saying, "Once you're in the gate, you're asking, what should we do?" And he says, "The Holy Ghost will teach, tell you all things what you should do." Right? This is Second Nephi, like 31 and 32, and he's kind of frustrated. I think the layman and Lemuel to keep asking. Um, when you're in this, when you have this justified, justified condition, scriptures also call that the remission of sins. That's when you have the full remission of your sins. Okay? But it comes after the repentance. And the repentance is holistic. You're repenting of all your sins. And then mercy is like. Right? Yeah, and the mercy kicks in when your whole heart kicks in. That's, what, that's where the grace comes from. Grace is always triggered from a whole-hearted action. Yeah, there's different kinds of grace. Yeah, yes, grace comes from like whole-hearted action. So, when you receive and obtain the remission of your sins, you're in the gate. And you have the Holy Ghost with you. Because you're justified. You're, you're in a resonance. You're in a frequency, right? You're in a, you're in a communal state. Now, is, your, is it all over? No, because there's lots of things going on still. But. Okay, you get remission of sin, but you can do that for the rest of your life and until you become a God. Yeah, yeah. So it's not done. Right. No, now you're in the state of retention, the retention territory. This is King Benjamin, right? He's like, this is how you retain a remission of your sins. And he gives, in like Mosiah 4 and 5, he gives you all this wonderful insight into you obtain a remission of sins, now you must re- you have a remission, now you must retain a remission. So when I say if you do this one thing, that's what we're talking about. If you just actively seek to retain a remission of your sins, it's one way of like looking at this, everything else falls into place. Okay? So 
and my understanding, so to retain remission of your sin is to repent daily. Yeah, but yeah, but don't think of repent. Like you can think of it like as like I think repent daily has this sort of default. Maybe it's just me. Like, but your heart is connected. To that. Yeah, I'm going to Lord. Like, yeah, I yelled at my kids last night, and as per usual, I yelled at my kids last night, and I got mad at the guy in the freeway, and you know, you're kind of calculating the things you did wrong. No, the repentance daily is is the daily broken heart, contrite spirit. You're going to the Lord, and you're completely reconciling everything in you to Him. That's repentance daily. You get caught in this trap of like going to the Lord and saying sorry for every little thing you did. That's not. He doesn't care. Like he really, he has no need to hear you say I'm sorry about this. He wants you to say, Why am I in a condition that I will yell at my kids? What's going on? What's the fear underneath? What's the, what are the deeper, darker, broken structures that are operating in the source code? That's what we're going to get at. Those are just fruits. You don't, you don't. Take a bite of fruit and get mad at the fruit. How do I change this fruit? You go look at the tree and see what's going on, right? That's kind of what we're getting at. Driving towards the leaves. It's like cleaning your house before somebody comes to clean your house. You, you don't have to go. That's to so clean what happens in our house. You go there to figure out how to change. Yeah, I often get told to clean things because the cleaners are coming over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Pick it up. Get ready. Um. Sanctification. Let's give a let's give a quick and a quick ballpark definition of sanctification. You're kind of like multiple people in one. It's the way to think about yourself. You get your spirit, and you got this crazy body that you inherited. And in this body, and within this great inheritance, you have generational DNA. You have all these things you inherited, familial DNA. You come from lots of ancestors. We saw a movie last night. Mark and I did. And he leans over to me and he's like, look at the suffering of these people with about some pioneers. And he's like, we, we're we carrying all that trauma, you know, that you're pulling forward. So your spirit, you can go to this justification, but you still have this meat suit. <laughs> but let's not, but let's, let's, let's treat it with a lot of love like it's a child, okay? And let's say, yeah, I'm inheriting all my generations, I'm inheriting a family. And, and this, I have a huge family, you know, like, but, you, know, you know, I need to trim the family. Intuitive eating would be helpful. My problem is I do intuitive eat. That's my whole problem. Is like my intuition is not calibrated. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, yeah, intuitively eat everything. Um, so sanctification is the state in which, as you retain a remission of your sins in a justified state that the body who is actively responding to or controlling the spirit begins to form and take the form of the spirit that is in a justified state. And so sanctification is the straight and narrow path that you're traversing of the body coming into and learning obedience and alignment to the justified spirit in which you are invested. So sanctification is this process of the body and the spirit becoming one. And that process is going to be very unique for all of us because we inherit unique things in our bodies, right? So people have this crazy like debate. Is becoming born again a, an, is it like an event or a process? Man, it just depends on what you're talking about. Because, because the born again of the spirit is always an event. But is birth an event or is birth a process? Well, you just say it's like nine months, and then you have an event called a birth. Is birthing a gestation and a birth? Well, yeah. So you have to think about it in terms of like that sort of thing, right? Like you, you gestate and you birth. So sanctification is this body coming into an alignment. Well, what happens a lot of times is, well, almost all the time, I think, is we get into the sanctification mode and you're like trying to wrestle your flesh into submission. Right? I gotta sanctify it. I've gotta like keep the commandments. I've got to perfect myself. You know, it's like this idea that like we can't perfect ourselves here, but when we die we have forever to learn how to perfect ourselves. And it's nonsense. It's the philosophies of men mingled with like barely any scripture. <laughs> like one percent to ninety nine percent. Okay? It's nonsense. The perfection is, is when you're in a state of justification and, you're, and the Lord forgives you remission of your sins and then he's going to t- 
take you through a process of, a, of retaining it and allowing that sanctification to take take its take its path. Okay. And then the. Let me correct. Sanctification is the spirit perfection. Sanctification is the body. I yeah. I'm, mm. We've all been learning long enough to know that we want to be really careful how we like box in certain ideas because I find that you have to kind of break those a lot. But I think if you can hold loosely hold that, I think that's I think from my own understanding that approximates I think what's happening. I think so. So when the Lord says be perfect even as I am perfect, that's a tall order because he's talking about perfection in a lot of different dimensions. Okay? This is a state of perfection. When you finish your sanctification, that's a state of perfection. When you obtain a ceiling, that's a state of perfection. Right? Because what you're doing is you're increasing in levels of wholeness and, and you're increasing in levels of redemption. Because as you go through this, as soon as this happens, then everything becomes very outward. And this is how you know you're in the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that you become very outward in the sense of you, you begin to, your heart turns towards other things to help them come to Christ. The first thing is your body. You're, you're becoming outward towards your body. You're starting to love it and, and invite it to the principles of the priesthood. So read, read DNC 121 if you want to know the principle of how to bring your flesh into subjection. Look at it through that lens. You want your children to start to hear the gospel. You want your wife and your, your spouse to, to bond to you. You want your family and your ward and whatever, right? This, these are the levels of redemption. So, Joseph Smith taught that um, to become saved, you're saving others. That's a way to, sur- like, to um, yeah, you're, you're, you're in a state of being saved when you're actively trying to save others. And saving others means you're, you're loving them, you're inviting them through love and, and attention and sacrifice to, to gather them. Okay? This is how Zion gets built. Right? So, one thing becomes all things. So, if you're wrestling with your flesh, you go to the Lord and you say, okay, I need to reconcile my spirit to the spirit of the Lord. And you reconcile that spirit to the spirit of the Lord. And that reconciliation will have an indirect effect on your body. So, let me make one more point and we can kind of move on from this. Um, what happens in the sanctification state, um, Joseph said, with, you know, in the restoration um, and in the, in the um, the kingdom of God coming forth, he says, we will have commandments, not a few, which is a glorious thing, right? So have commandments, not a few, because what happens is, you come into this structure, like you have a remission of your sins, and then the Lord says, okay, here's your next commandment. And when he gives you another commandment, and these are going to be uh, structured in the church, because you're going to have things like chastity and, and consecration, if you think in terms of the endowment. I'm sorry, I'm talking so fast, but I feel like I have to go fast. Is that okay? Yeah. No, okay, so endowment. Um, initiatory, where you're invited into all of this. You come into celestial, right? celestial portion is this. Okay? When you cross over to the terrestrial portion, you're crossing into this. The terrestrial portion of the endowment is the straight and narrow path. Okay? That's the sanctification portion. You get chastity here, you get consecration here, you have the altar here with the veil, this is the celestial, this is the ceiling. Okay? This is the born again experience and crossing into the, this is the gate, like in the high stream. You're going from the celestial to the terrestrial. They used to have you, um, you used to turn the lights on. You know, now you're in the terrestrial kingdom. Lights go on. Or you move to a room, a terrestrial room. Um, that's the born again experience. That's when you, that, that now you're in a sanctified structure where your body, can, body and things around you can be part of that sanctification process. Uh, shoot, I forgot what we did the down part. Oh, oh, laws. Yeah, so you get laws here, right? You're getting new laws. Chastity. That's how I call chastity, C-H. <laughs> right, so. Okay, so the reason is, is because when the Lord gives you a new law, what is he, he's giving you, kind of think of it like a layer of light. 
He's layering light on you. When you get light, you have to actively receive it. And because he's giving it to you from a higher place to a lower place, it requires a new level of a broken heart and a contrite spirit to obtain something higher. Okay? And this is why this justification broken heart activity on a daily basis, on a, like, like the sister was saying, on an ongoing basis, is the way that you actively go down this path. Because what's happening is he's giving you more and more light and laws and commandments. So this is why in like 88 um, he says, then you shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's, that's a part of this. You have to get the Holy Ghost. Shorthand. I'm what? just saying sanctification, straight, narrow, name. What is the last word? Right here? No, um, under sanctification. Right here? No, sanctification. The next one. Okay, what's that last key word? No, I'll show you our path. 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 Okay, yeah. and then the first one under sealing is? Here? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Something <laughs> married Zion. Ourselves. One. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we were just trying to... Tyrolific. I'm weakened as to writing. Yeah, it's okay. I'm trying to understand the short language. But so they shall mock at my words. No, I'm, weak, I'm weakened to writing. No, that actually making me... The Gentiles will mock Trying me. to understand it makes me remember it now. So. <laughs> there you go. There's purpose. Yeah. Um, so... You get more and more words of the Lord. The Lord will give you more and more. And this is why you're an ongoing um, sanctified process. He will reveal himself through his commandments. And so you have to, if you're actively pursuing this broken heart and contrite spirit, this active sacrifice in a continual way, the Lord will keep giving you more and more light. And each time he gives you a layer of light, it's, a, it's sort of a test. It's sort of this, can my heart get broken to go to this next portion this is why you're in a constant state of sacrifice. So this is to your point back here. Well, am I going to give up my house? I don't know. Did the Lord tell you? Maybe it's a weird commandment. He's like, go buy that house. And you're like, uh, that's more than I need. And he's like, yeah. And you're like, is this me giving myself a revelation? Go on that house? You know what I mean? This is why you have to be in this state all the time. These people have this, this other continual question of like, was it me or my... Is it me giving me a revelation or is it my... Uh, the Lord, right? Do I desire that for myself? Or yeah, or you have this kind of wrestle. Have that so I can help more people. Yeah, so this is why you always back out of it and you go back to here. And if you continually retain a remission of your sins, you will grow in a perceptivity of the Spirit of the Lord. You will recognize His voice. And that's actually part of this whole path is being able to recognize His voice in more and more precise and intimate ways. Because... <clears throat> Part of this path is overcoming all of the deceptions and counterfeits that you have to overcome at every level. You have to overcome them. And when, you, when you're going up the mountain of the Lord, here's you going up the mountain of the Lord, here's the Lord. Here's your deceptions and counterfeits. They're going this way and you're going this way. The space between these gets shorter and shorter and shorter which means it's harder and harder to tell the distinction between the counterfeit and the real thing. Mm. Okay? And this is why you have to become more and more conversant in the Spirit of the Lord so you can perceive counterfeit distinction because they're everywhere. They're, they're, like the more, you, the more you approach the Lord, it's not like it gets easier. You have to be prepared to encounter the most... the the worst kinds of counterfeit deception that look almost exactly like the real thing. Mm. And Joseph said, to overcome a false Christ, which is part of this, the only way you can do it is if you have pure love, pure charity. Which is interesting, huh? So, you see why the kind of the thesis of this conversation is, is you just have to live here. If you live here, if you... If your daily walk is this, I'm going to get up in the morning, I'm going to reconcile myself to the Spirit. Like completely. Like completely. What that will mean is, like three years from now, the Lord's going to be giving you a whole new, a whole new set of laws, words from His mouth. He's going to give you sacrifices continually. But like He'll command them. And those sacrifices will be the channels through which you go from a lower place to a higher place. Because if you're going up this ascension mount, these levels of ascension, right? 
in order for any light to go from a higher place to a lower place, it comes by the principle of sacrifice. And for you to go from a lower place to a higher place, it comes by the principle of sacrifice. Faith in the sacrifice, right? That's how it always happens. So if light is going to come down from above to some place lower, it comes to the principle of sacrifice. And if you want to go from somewhere lower, somewhere higher, the person going down, or whatever, the way you think about it, is going to give you the sacrifice to move into it. You don't choose your sacrifices. Usually, I think. <laughs> I don't know if that's axiomatic, but I think it's, it's true enough to make a principle, okay? It's maybe not axiomatic. But. So, does that make sense? Do you have an example? What's that? Do you have an example? Of what particularly? Just what you said. Of this? Personal experience. Oh, oh yeah. Like, <laughs> okay, so let's let's talk about macro and move it in, okay? For all of for all of the plan of salvation to work, someone had to go from the highest ascension and go below all things so that they could be the light and truth of all things. Right? The atonement is the full condescension of sacrifice that draws the light of heaven down to just about zero light structure of hell so that anything down at the lowest can begin to respond and sacrifice into something higher. Okay, and that's how you go up. The Lord has a, cas- a cascade of hierarchy of beings who are seeking him and as the way they seek him is, how do you get saved? You save others. By the way they seek him is by performing sacrifices downward. And so there's constant there's a constant order of sacrifice downward in order to go upward. It's like a chiasm and like when he's yeah. he's washing their feet and showing service to sacrifice. Yeah, it's a priest of chiasm. Yeah. Don't think it and think of priesthood as like a broader Structure of men and women. Okay, so um, yeah, the first should be last, the last should be first. So the priest is chiasmus. The first should be last, and the last should be first. He who is greatest shall be the least. Right? This is being fifty. It is appointed all. It is appointed to them to be the greatest. Nonetheless, they should be the, ser- the least in the servant of all. Right? And they'll be the possessor of all things. Okay. So subtract so these. So this is in the fifty. Subtract this. So he's talking about priesthood. You should know the darkness that you may you you should know the light that you may chase darkness from among you, and you shall be a possessor of all things, both the light and the life, the spirit and the power of Jesus Christ. And who shall ever who shall ever have a possessor of all things? No man is a possessor of all things unless he be purified from all sin. You see this? It's right here. Can you read it? But no man is possessor of all things except he be purified and cleansed from all sins. Yeah, that's what he says. Yeah. That's Not 50, 50, 28, 29. And if you are purified and cleansed from all sins, you shall ask whatsoever you will in the name of Jesus, and it shall be done. Yep. So, so once again, we come back to this singular point. If you focus just on this, you're going to be fine. It's sufficient. Think, of, think in terms of... Um, uh, sufficient as the day is evil thereof, what is that? Oh, sufficient as the day is evil thereof. Yeah, like, like, no, oh, never mind, that's a weird way of putting it. Okay, so, so this is priesthood, by the way. Priesthood is, priesthood is the order of those who are going down to condescend in order for those to go up and get light. It's, it's one way to think about the grand principle of priesthood. It's the order of those who are willing to go down in order for others to go up. Think about you in the birthing room when you had your kids. Mm-hmm. You're going down to the death or for you to bring forth life. A true priest that on the male portion, on the male side, will it's 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 the posture of John. It's 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 John, um, I will decrease so that he will increase. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, I'm not worthy to latch at his shoes, something like that. Um, you perform sacrifices 
to draw other people into Christ. That's, that's the principle of priesthood. You're drawing light down through sacrifice, and you're going up through sacrifice. It's this, it's this constant move this way, up and down. You go down to go up, and you go up to go down. It's this, there, and this is where you get eternal rounds and stuff. So, um, so your question about sacrifice, I don't know, should we say your house? Just go back to here. Work, get this first. Get a clarity. When your sacrifice is given to you, or the commandments given to you, whatever you want to, however you want to call that, you, I can say, you move forward. But the justification is what gives you the confidence that's coming from the Lord. And it's your sacrifices that gives you the confidence that you're in the way with the Lord. And this is the other thing I wanted to get to, but what time is it? Oh, you got an almost an hour. Oh, okay. Maybe we'll make a... Maybe we'll talk about this to a whole other vector. Would that be okay? Yeah. We built a lot, though, here, so... How about the sacrifice of the Okay, so your faith in the Lord is one way of, one way of thinking about it. And it's, a, it's sort of a primary core way. Your faith in the Lord will always be a function of your knowledge of your standing with Him. Okay. Say that again. Your faith in the Lord will always be a function of a knowledge of your of the standing you have with him. Okay? So you know who you are. You, come you know who you are in relationship in, to him, in, because you can be pretty bad. Yeah, well, I meant... In, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, can we erase this? Yeah. Um, any other thing in terms of this? Because I don't want to... Let's talk about this whole thing again. Let's talk about it through a completely different lens. Um, so, remember how we kind of started out and said, like, a principle, a true eternal principle will have, like, coarse, simple dimensions, but they'll, they'll almost be able to expand out to have infinite depth to them, right? So when someone says, uh, you learn everything you know in primary. It's totally true, but it can be totally false. <laughs> but don't leave it there. <laughs> well, yeah, because like, because yeah, everything is given to you. The fundamentals of existence of eternity are given to you in primary. But if you kind of think the way you think about it when you're taught in primary is sufficient, then you're done. But it's, anyway, you need a good Okay, so, um, Joseph Smith. Let's talk about Joseph, okay? Uh, Joseph Smith. I use an analogy for yeah. that. Mm-hmm. It's like saying that um, our bodies are enough to have a skeleton instead of all the build-up. So have the muscles and all the layers of the nervous system, and each one's a, an intelligent system unto itself. So, yes, the basics are there to hold the structure of eternity, but it's not... Going yeah. to no, Yeah, totally. Completely. Yeah. So it's, it's right now my son's a missionary and they're just teaching the basics, but it's it's once they become a member and they want to serve and understand, yeah. they can even buy a preach by gospel or, or go on and Yeah. Like if you so teach the basics can... right, it works. If you teach the basics in a crappy way, then yeah. they get stuck real fast. The whole tradition. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so Joseph I'm going to make a case for something for you. I hope, I hope this will awaken something in you that you'll go do, okay? I'm just going to tell you my intention of birth. <laughs> the intention is I want, I hope, I invite to you at the appropriate time in your life, whether it's today or 10 years, to go get lectures on faith and incorporate it into your scripture study as a scripture, okay? Because it is. So uh, some of you might know this, some of you may not. When we say doctrine and covenants, okay, 
the doctrine of the Doctrine and Covenants, there's a part one and a part two. Okay? What we have in our Doctrine and Covenants today, when you go to Desert Book and you buy it, you get on LDS Tools and you read your DNC, you're just reading part two. Okay? Because they took out the lectures of faith. Part one doctrine is the lectures of faith. Okay? Mm-hmm. And as missionaries, they're supposed to study it. Are they? Yeah, the five books, you know, they still have to sound as Jesus the Christ. They put Legends of Faith in that? Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Which is good. So yeah, I don't think it's even like in the library. Yeah. It's amazing. Anyway. So, Legends of Faith is the doctrinal portion of the Doctrine and Covenants. Wow. That's why, with confidence, I invite you to go put it in your scriptures and read it as that. Okay? Why they took it out is a whole other discussion. I don't care to wade into it unless you really want to get into it, but I don't think we need to. Because there's better things to talk about first, okay? So, why is Legends of Faith the doctrine? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, hopefully, if you'll, if, you'll, if you'll bear with me or, or um, trust me a little bit, well, not trust me, but just let me, I want to make a case to you, and if it resonates, wonderful. If it doesn't, it's fine. So, my case is that Joseph Smith saw the principle of faith as containing, in that principle, everything you will ever need to know and do in eternity. All doctrine is centered in this singular principle. You learn this, you learn everything. Okay? He, he, he says it. I hope my phone starts reading to you. He, so he says this is the beginning. Faith is the beginning and the end. Therefore, it is the eternity to eternity of principles. Faith is beginning and the end. It is the fundamental eternal of he said it was, it's the fundamental principle of power in existence, mm-hmm. in reality, okay, is faith. So if we learn the principle of faith, we will learn everything else. Everything's contained in it. So everything we just did about justification, sanctification, sealing, being your calling election, make sure, rending veils, your sacrifices, your, your, your ongoing sacrifices, everything's contained in this singular principle. You learn lectures of faith, Joseph explains structurally why in lectures. That's why it's a critical, I think it's probably... There's seven lectures, too. Yeah. Yeah, there's seven lectures. Mm -hmm. Okay? And what he does is he starts with the question of what is faith, and he ends with how do you be saved? How are you saved? Answering that question. What is faith, and how are you saved? And it's all contained in the arc of the seven lectures. You have to read them in an arc. He's making a building case. He calls it the theology of religion. The science of theology, sorry. Theology of religion. That's weird. The science of, of, of theology, the science of religion, is understanding faith. If you understand faith, you understand everything. Okay? So, I wanted to lay out what he kind of said, which is another way of explaining what we just talked about. Okay? So, faith... Let's kind of let's kind of like lay out the arc of, of his arc in his presentation. And so mind you also that when he has the lectures of faith, and one of the reasons why they took it out is because it reads more like um, it reads more like I look fat about it, I don't know how to sit up. Like you see yourself in the video. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, intuitive eat. Less intuitively. Okay. More spiritually less physically. Yeah. Um, so, oh, yeah. So the lectures. One reason they took it out is it read too much. Reads too much like a like lectures. It didn't have like that scriptural cadence, you know. I think it, which is a, I think a massive mistake. But who cares if it sounds like King James scriptural language? This is like Bruce McConkie said. This is lectures of faith is pure scriptural. Right, it, it is pure scripture. So, uh, it reads like a, it reads like a, uh, an education, like a, like, a, like a textbook. And at the end, he has questions. You ask the questions, and he commits you to memorizing portions of it, because it was the text, or one of the texts of the school of the prophets. And think of the school of prophets as sort of like the learning school, the mystery school of the temple. Like when you go to the temple to become educated, to learn, it's a, it's a learning institution. It's like the Lord's University. Think of lectures of faith as your primary text 
in the temple as you're learning your, your textbook. You know. So, um, this isn't going to be anywhere near justice, but I kind of want to give you an idea of what he's talking, what he's saying, the argument he's making, or the principle he's teaching. And he starts with the question of what is faith? And, you know, he answers that using scripture in Hebrew, and he, you know, it's the principle of action of all intelligent beings, and he says it's also the principle of power of all intelligent beings. So everything he says from, from doing manual work on the earth to um, creating worlds, that end, is all done on the principle of faith. All of creation is done on faith. Everything is done on principle of faith. So it's the principle of power and the principle of action in all intelligent beings, God included. God works on faith. Okay? Let me explain how. So, principle of power and action. And then he makes this point that um, I'm, I'm loosely going on the way he does it, so I just want to kind of draw some principles, okay? He makes this point that you can only... Faith is acting on something that's true, okay? Faith is acting on something that is true, that you don't know or possess yet, okay? So let's, let's talk about how to think through that. Maybe. Maybe this is helpful. Maybe it's not. But like, if I am going to move over here, and I'm going, to, I'm going to commit to the action of flipping a light switch, you know, like I do this, um, I have faith in this action because I've witnessed the probability of that happening so many times, the cause and effect of that. I've seen it so many times that my faith in this is like at the 99% level and I know that it doesn't work because there's a circuit problem or there's a light bulb problem. Okay, right? Right. So, I, but, but me doing this is still an act of faith because I am not 100% certain that that thing will happen. Okay? So, in order to have faith in God, or true faith, let's just call it true faith, you have to have faith in a true principle. So, like either. If he found the stone... Yeah, but, but, but zoom out of that a little bit. What happened before the, the stones? What was he... He was being tutored. He was told to go get them. Told, yeah. He, this, he was a whole different thing with the stones, yeah. Well, it, this, it, it, it shows it's a good use case for our principal. We talk about the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. He's being told what to do. Right. He doesn't know, go get stones, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fashion them, purify them. Mm-hmm. Right? He's acting in faith on something, because, and he has faith, not because he knows what's going to happen but because he knows that the voice telling him is telling him something truthful. So he's, he's obtaining light, he's responding to light and faith, and the results of faith always end in knowledge. That's the result of true faith. True faith will always, always, always end up in knowledge. So can true faith be a feeling, like you feel it in your heart, in your heart? Yeah, as long as you're in a, as long as, yes, as long as the feeling is being informed by light and not through self-deception. And this is why we go back to justification all the time. Because the way you get out of self-deception is through the remission of sin. Does that make sense? You see why there's an order of operations here? Mm-hmm why you get the remission of sins first and then you have light and then the feeling um, and people people describe the Holy Ghost as a feeling I think well it's okay because Moroni does too so I'm not going to go after it too much it, it is a feeling but it also kind of depends on what we call feeling the Holy Ghost is always one thing and it's pure intelligence well it's kind of like a burning of the bosom yeah. feeling yeah, so a burning in the bosom could be because I am like a hormone-fueled 17-year-old kid, <laughs> right? 
And I see the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in my life walk by. And I have a burning in the bosom. Or a burning in the bosom is the, the ignition of the light of God. So, um, and it'll, anyways, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole. The point is, is, always go back to this initial point. You go back always to justification. Because if you're in a state of remission, the Holy Ghost becomes the dominant activating aspect of your being. You know, when you're in a state of remission, of sin. the Holy Ghost becomes the dominant, the dominant driver. I'm, I'm not undermining at all because you're exactly right. It is a feeling. It could be a feeling. Because like when you experience intelligence or light and truth, um, you're going to have a physiological response to it. You might identify more with that physiological response. You also have to be careful because that physiological response could similarly be induced by something that's not the Holy Ghost. So the idea is, is to like grow in your capacity to taste light. This is Alma 32, right? So he says, how do I know it's a good seed? Behold, it, is, it tastes good. I taste light. Right? It is delicious unto me. And then he says, is your knowledge perfect in this thing? And he says, yes. Right? And then he says, is your knowledge perfect? And he says, no. Because you see how like, the obtaining of knowledge is the, is the actively pursuing in faith, responding to light. You obtain knowledge in a thing, so it's now part of your greater faith structure, because you now have a knowledge, like I know what that light switch is going to do. But you're not done, you have to keep going, because your knowledge is yet to be perfect in all things. Does that make sense? Alma 32 is super instructive on this. So I think it's interesting when you talk about even how Father in Heaven acts and lives by the power of faith. And his whole purpose is to help the eternal life and progression of man. Yeah. And so isn't it amazing? Yes. That act of faith. Why? Because the power of free agency, even though he can see all things, and even though there is no time, and he knows the past, the present, and the future. And I think, wow, even knowing that, there's still the act of faith, even though... Okay, so let's talk about this. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, can you hold? Do you want to go right now? Can we just interject right okay. there? Has, they have to be rooted in a trustworthy, perfect... Yeah. Being. That does help perfectly. So God has faith in himself. Yes. So God has, Joseph um, articulates this point by saying, God has independent faith in himself. We have dependent faith in God. That's actually like almost close to exactly what he says. Like, not exactly, but he uses those words. So to this point, to your point, he starts to lay out. This is where you get... Um, a lot of you probably are familiar with this articulation from the lectures where he says you have to have um, a true understanding of his character, attributes, perfections, right, to exercise faith. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, let's go beyond that a little bit. I want to expand Joseph a little bit on this. It's not really expanding, because he kind of gets to it, but he says it in a roundabout way. So when we say his attributes, his, his character, attributes, perfections, he, Joseph also speaks to a number of things that God does perfectly that gives us reason to have faith in him. And he goes through, he goes through like six things, and he says um, he's omniscient. You know, he knows all things. He's omnipresent. He's, he's everywhere and aware of everything. Um, he's um, eternal, so um, there's no time. Uh, there's no time constraints, both forward and backward on him. Uh, he has perfect justice. So you don't have to have faith in somebody who's going to let things slide so to speak. Justice, that's another conversation to have, but justice is just as desirable as mercy. We, we kind of did this like weird pendulum swing into mercy and everything's justice is the bad guy and mercy is the good guy. Nonsense. Justice is what you want. Mercy is how you get it. Okay? Let's do the reason on that for a second because this okay, might be like helpful. Yeah, justice is what you want. Mercy is how you get it. Grace is how you get it. Think of justice as not like I'm getting... Think of justice as the structure of all existence from this board in this house. That's an eternal law. Mm-hmm. It's the eternal existence. Yes. It's yes. God is justice. Anything that is structured or formed eternally in creation is a form of justice. It I heard is, it once that it, it is what makes the world feel right. 
Yeah, yeah, like justice is like synonymous to this. Like justice is the order. Justice is the thing. Like the world coming together and holding is justice. You standing here, you breathing is by justice. You're, That's law, right? It's by law, yeah. Law is justice. So everything is just according to the law that it lives. It's the square that measures things. Yes. Right? Yes. So justice is everything. Everything you want in your existence is justice. <laughs> you having an eternal spouse that loves you and you love them, that is a state of justice, Okay. God loving you and embracing you and giving you all that he has is a state of justice. You're just with God. You're in existence with him. It's a level of justice. Every kingdom that you want to live in is just a level of justice. And what mercy does is it restores you into something that you don't have anymore. Grace gives you something of just that you can't get yourself. So everything is about coming into justice. And people are like, justice sucks. Oh, sorry. Justice, sucks. justice is awful. Justice is... I don't want justice, I want mercy. Like, no, you want justice. You need mercy to get it. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. That's the way to think about it. It's like you're justified when you're the remission of your sins. You're back into a true structure or a true communion with God. You want to be justified. You want God to be just. Does that make sense? Okay, so I, that primary reorientation is really helpful because when you understand who God is, God is the fulfillment of justice at every level of existence in eternity. This is why you can have faith in him. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That's why you can have faith in him. There's no darkness in him. There's no darkness in him. That's why you can have perfect faith in God. Okay? So, here's the problem that we all run into. Um, where am I on time? Make sure I can wrap in the right way. Oh, it's 11. We can 11.30, quarter to 12, whatever. Okay. Um, so, the chances of you having a true perception of God is like 1%. <laughs> Herein lies the problem, okay? You don't know God. The problem is you don't know him. And to jump to the conclusion, Joseph Smith says, that you are actually saved when you have a perfect knowledge of him. That's when you're saved. Wow. And you're not saved until you do. And not only that, you can't know him unless you're like him in every way. It's the most radical... It's the most radical articulation of salvation that I've ever come across. We'll get to build to that because it can can get your heart rate up. Well, it feels hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> because Lucifer's taught us a false religion. Yes. Okay? That's why. The hopelessness comes, the spirit comes because of iniquity. We're, we're in iniquity, and our, and our perceptions don't see a path to that that gives us any type of indication. No faith. Because when you came from him, then there's a way back to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, the idea is, you come from him, but the idea is, the way back is that is a path of obtaining things you've never had before. You're, you're, does that make sense? You, you come here to get something that you can't get. Anyway, we'll go back. Okay, so, um, okay, so like in Moroni, I think about, um, I think it's Moroni 7. He says, have you imagined up into yourself a God who can do no miracles? Okay. So this is a really interesting way of phrasing this because you can kind of expand that out a little bit and say, what God have you imagined up into yourself? Because until you know God, until you know no God, with a perfect knowledge, to some degree or another, you're going to imagine up unto yourself a God to make up that space that you don't know. And the chances of the God that you made up in that space in distorting your power of faith is 100%. You see the problem you're in? You can't really have faith in God only to the degree that the knowledge of God that you do possess is 100% true. So we're in a pickle. You can't know God unless you have full faith. You can't exercise full faith unless you know him. It's a chicken and egg problem. Right? You see what I'm saying? All of you sitting here, unless you... I shouldn't say that. Maybe some of you know God, and you do. Maybe we can talk privately later. <laughs> um, but unless you know God, you have to go through the process of him incrementally 
revealing himself to you and you having faith in those increments until you come into a full knowledge of him. Okay? But the revelation has to come from him. Because if not, you're going to imagine up into yourself a God that does not exist. And therefore you will have faith in something that doesn't exist. And your faith will avail you nothing. Or weird things. Or even bad things. Okay? Mm-hmm. So, I like that. does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's why that whole thing that you just showed us is so important. Because it's line upon line. Yeah. And we have to have those individual, like over and over things. Like it's not, it's not a one-shot deal, and it's it, it's continual, and it's over and over until it comes to this point. Like when Christ comes, we yeah. will know Him because we will be like Him. Like you can't skip those steps. Yeah, exactly. He will reveal to you according to your capacity and according to the speed that you can go, and according to your faith. How willing are you to engage that path forthrightly and in faith and diligence? Why? So you endure to the end. The endurance, the end is the knowledge of God. Right. It's not death. Yeah. 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 says that you will have miracles if you exercise your faith. Yeah, it's the fruits that are coming out of it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. exactly. That's a whole other conversation. So we're sacrificing to move on line upon line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every time he gives you a commandment, there's going to be a sacrifice and obedience associated with it. You move in that structure. And you keep moving. This is grace for, this is John, this is DNC 93. It was grace to grace and mm-hmm. grace for grace. And you too can have the record, the full record of John, if you'll do that same pattern. Christ did not receive a fullness of first, but he went from grace to grace to grace. When you say he gives you a commandment, is this, I'm sure it means both, what we're told in the church commandments and the new scriptures, but then our own individual revelations is yeah. what you're saying. Exactly. Okay. But in 88, he says, then you will, then you will um, live by all words that proceed from the words of the God. God will give you commandments. He will teach so it's you. It's the same prophet. Yeah. And commandments, um, instantly, yeah. meant instructions. So when I hear the word commandment, like he'll, he'll instruct me to like get away, do away with something that I shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then that I'll get us to call in an election. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, calling election. You're called when you're invited into the structure. You're elect when you're actively pursuing it, and uh, it's made sure or sealed when it's completely fulfilled, and you can't fall from it. So you have calling and elect- you have ele- callings and elections made sure of many things. Mm-hmm. Your own, like think of think of all the veils you go through in the temple and down it. Like the first veil you go through is calling election made sure of yourself. That's the ceiling. That's you yeah, your what? Sorry, can you about calling and sure? uh, you're called when you're invited in. So um, that can look like a lot of different things. Like it's like the idea of um, uh, DMT4, like if you have desires, you're called to the work. I think it's DMT4. Um, if you have desires, you're called to the work. Ordinances in their forms, uh, and if they're not complete, but you're just getting the form, those are all callings. You're being called. Baptism without the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a call into the structure. Um, if you're ordained, um, like priest ordination, from apostolic ordinations to elder to priest, to ironic priesthood ordination. Ordinations are always just a call. You're invited into a structure. Like, like when you get the milk of the priesthood by the laying on of hands, you don't have the milk of the priesthood. You have the, you have the right to officiate any ordinances of the milk of the priesthood as a call into, into a formalized outward structure. But it's an invitation into a structure in which you obtain through faith the full powers of the priesthood in which you're, you're ordered. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're left or you're chosen when you are in the act of in your you're in the act of reception or possession of. So, like when you're born again, you're chosen. You're left. But it requires your faith, right? Yeah, you're always moving in faith, right? You're, you're nowhere. Can you expound just a little bit more when you say, um, "Endure to the end" is the knowledge of God, not fear? Yeah. So think of it. Just think real, like straightforwardly, the tree of life. Um, we get lots of answers to what the tree of life is because the tree of life represents a lot of different stuff. Um, the tree of life is Reve- Revelation. In the book of Revelation, it's um, you've overcome the world. You've overcome all things. It's the uh, fullness of the love of God. As Lehi says, true love of God. It's the calling let you make sure. It's, 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 the, va- it's the unveiling of Father, Mother, everything else that's unveiled. And then you proceed. Uh, it's we're we're attuned to thinking of things very linearly. 
So many, this is a weird, I'm going to throw this out there, but I don't want to explore it very much. You're always kind of in a tree of life. There's trees of life and tons of trees of life. If you're always going through a tree of life, because a tree of life is just like an integration process. So when you're going through like the process of faith, and you're receiving remission of your sins, it's the integration of your spirit to come into a singular, singular wholeness with God. Think of, you can think of everything as like a, I think, a male and female portion. Right? Yeah. Like, you, yeah, the Kabbalistic tree of life. Mm-hmm. So everything has a male and female portion, and you're bringing them into a, into a um, integration, into a unity. So your spirit, when you're born again and justified, you're bringing your spirit to a unity, so you're sanctified. Your spirit, that's justification, you have God. And then the next level, the tree of life, would be like your body and your spirit. Your body's like, some people say the body's like the female portion, whatever. Either way, the male, female, your body, your spirit come together. Once you do that, then you go to like your husband and wife come together. Zion, Godhood, da 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 da. So you're going through trees of life. So everything, one, one way of thinking about it is like everything's an integration of the male female. In every, in every manifestation, male female being an archetype beyond just uh, sexual. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It's a whole other conversation we have. So, so is the knowledge of God? And so you're trying to stay through the tree of life? No. You're enduring, you're enduring the, the tree of life, the fullness of the tree of life. At the end is the tree of life. In, yeah. So it's the yeah. 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 So um, so in the temple endowment, you know, you, you're you going through all these different callings and lecture nature, so to speak. Um, can I give you a bunch of references? Yeah. Jason, so you want Go through uh, Mosiah 25 and 26. Mosiah 26? No, Mosiah 25. Alma was a senior, hearing from the heavens, voice of God, saying, You have eternal life. It's calling election of voice, conversing with the Lord through the veil. Think of that. Before you go through the veil, you converse with him through the veil. You don't see him, but you're conversing. Mosiah 25. Uh, conversing with the Lord through the veil. Think either 224. Brother Jared. Um, then you have the next the next ceiling would be your marriage because you go women and men go through that in, that veil single and separately, independent of each other. You're not married yet. In the, in the endowment presentation of the endowment, you are not married. So you sit separately. You're not together. You go through that veil independently, retain those blessings, and then you're prepared to go into a ceiling, which would be like the next level of endowment. And then you go to the next level and down it, which is where you get the second anointing blessing. Which is a whole other thing. So, to do this, is that, is that okay? Is that sufficient? Okay. Adam, so Joseph makes this really interesting point. It's kind of an obvious point, but I thought it was really fascinating. He says, what, give, what gave the first family of God, Adam's family, faith? the fact that Adam knew God. Adam knows him. He's walked with him. He knows him intimately. He knows him in that total intimate way. So when they go through the fall, he retains that knowledge. And he can speak about God freely to his kids. He says, this is where faith is generated. By hearing the word of testimony from those who know God. And they can they can they can germ or they can like plant a seed in you because they know him and they can tell you truthful things about him. Because this is why the, all the ancient saints came into the presence of God, like, you know, the early, like, you know, Adam's posterity up to Noah. It's, it's a, and he recites this in lectures, but it's a genealogy of those who went into the presence of God and who knew him. But they knew him because Adam knew him. And Adam could say, this is what he's like. This is who he is. And then when they receive the word from the testimony of Adam, they can then start to exercise faith on that word. When they exercise faith, then they then they initiate their own process of knowing God in the same way that Adam did. This knowing, coming to the process of knowing God, is the process of salvation. That is salvation. And this is why Joseph says, uh, faith comes from hearing the testimony of apostles and prophets. And the way he uses the term apostle prophet is that apostle and prophet is someone who knows God 
intimately in all the ways that you can, and then teaches you how to know him too. So it comes by those who know him. So you have to exercise faith in a true thing. True thing. Not a vain imagination. Well, God only does this. I'm not showing faith in a God that you might have a totally incorrect perception about. Or God, you know, you see this all the time. Like, you see all these, like, you see all these different projections of who people think and groups think God is. Like, and you can have, it's kind of comical in a way when you, when you kind of look back. You have like different, like, different Christian denominations, and I'll throw ours in there too. Like, God is the, God is the so the footloose, the footloose God, like the God of like stern, we're gonna, we're gonna whip these kids into subjection. They can't dance. This very like pure, puritanical, like controlling justice. You will burn God to the hippie Jesus of like yeah, we've got to love, and the worst sin is judgment. You know, like <laughs> to this weird hippie Jesus, to like the God of like whatever path you is the path for you. You do you, I'll do me, and that's God. Or the path of like, God is um, A, B, C, D, you do A, you do B, you do C, you do E, it goes to F, G, and da, 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 da. It's, it's, it's uh, very formulaic. To like, I make fun of the Mormon, LDS version, because my whole life I've heard like church videos of God talking in like this quasi-British accent, because that makes him holy. <laughs> the Lord said, do, do, do. You're like, what? You think he talks that way? Does he talk like in a British accent all the time? Like, you know, you get these different variations. The New Deseret Book one is kind of like the, the really good looking Jesus. Like, kind of. It's like weird. It's like the, like the 40 year old Mormon housewife in Draper who loves, wants that picture of Jesus in the house because it's like, she wants her husband to look like that. <laughs> I'm cynical, but it's like, it drives me nuts. I can't even walk in there. It's like, ugh. Um, you project your vain imagination on God. I do, I do it. I have to stop all the time and say, the God I'm exercising faith in is just the true God. Am I exercising it in a revelation he gave me or am I exercising faith in, in a projection? Okay? So, um, this is why I like the chosen so much. Because, and I think a lot of people feel this way too, like the way they depict Christ is like probably the most I've ever resonated with somebody. And I, we were talking about this the other day. I think it's because he sort of like captures this um, this uh, feeling of being really present, right? So like like he's talking to somebody, and if in that moment of presence, he's to be kind of relaxed and approachable. He is. He's kind of funny sometimes, or he's really intense. Or he's inviting you into really hard things, or he's comforting you. Like it's a very present connection. I think it resonates with people because I think that's probably about the best. What's that? Relatable. Yeah, like he really relates to you where you're at. But he's not like the hippie Jesus. Like, yeah, you're cool. Go for it. You're good. And he's not like cracking on people. He does all that stuff, right? Anyways. Um, so the idea here is, is that in order to exercise faith, one of the best things you can do is, is well, think about Adam. The first thing Adam's told is to get, do sacrifices. So that's the, that's the principle, that's the pattern that we're going to lay out. Adam does the sacrifices first, and then he gets further light and knowledge that he can then exercise faith on. But he waits, the further light and knowledge comes by having faith through his sacrifices, then he can get more about, know about God more. And in, in that process, he also has to get rid of the counterfeit that comes in. So it's like sacrifice, counterfeit, true thing, Sacrifice, counterfeit, true thing. Sacrifice, counterfeit, true thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then your iniquity comes from you projecting on what you think God is and trying to have faith in that thing, and that's usually just a projection of your own ego. This is why religions catastrophically fail always. Not that religion's bad. Religion's good and bad. Religion is just the united structure of expressions of faith. But most faith is vain because most faith is in a vain God, our projection of collective imagination. Ours included. Because unless you're in Zion, you're doing it. Unless Christ is showing up in your congregation, you're doing it. It doesn't invalidate what's going on, but it should give you pause to what's actually happening. Does that make sense? 
If you have Zion, he shows up and he ministers to you. If he's not showing up, it's because you're exercising faith in some degree, in some sort of projection of a vain imagination, collective or individual. Does that make sense? That's true. So you have all these people like, religion's crap, religion does this, this, and this. Like, yeah, but religion's also like Zion. Religion caused World War II. Religion also saved World War II. <laughs> right? But it's just collective faith. People, people are like, so like thin in their thinking when they go after religion. Well, I'm going to be spiritual, not religion. Oh, yeah, you're going to go get with a bunch of people who are also spiritual and do ritual? Well, there's your new, there's new religion, right? There's your new collective projection. Good luck escaping religion. We were talking about this last night. Go to a football game and you just join your next religion. Yeah. Right? Because maybe your God now is, is forget this esoteric stuff. I'm just going to like get rich and watch sports. <laughs> and I'm going to go do all the pageantry of getting rich because I'm, I'm worshiping a new God. And it's a God of my own image. You see what I'm saying? You see what this is driving? So, is it a condemnation on all of us? Yeah. Yes. Everything. Unless Christ is showing up, you're in a state of, of somewhere acting in, in false faith structures. Do we do it? Yeah. Let's be honest about it. You can't, you can't repent unless you're honest about what you're doing. Go ahead. It reminds me of this, this uh, idea that the speed at which you can progress is proportional to the ability to see yourself as you really are and not run away from it. Mm-hmm. That's so good. Yeah, the, speed of, the speed at which you can progress is proportional, it is proportional to the ability to see yourself as you really are and not run away from it. That sounds like me playing Yeah. Let's end with this point, okay? Yeah, that's good. Because um, my wife is like um, really drawn out this principle in a really good way, like a really profound way for me and a lot of people. And, and it's sort of like, <clears throat> it's kind of like today's the only day that matters. And right now it's like the only thing that matters. It's kind of like just being present. And she uses the term <laughs> bypassing, which I think is, is a um, probably like a, a, a therapeutic or a psycho- psychological term, maybe. So let's use her term that she uses, bypassing. And in our efforts to exercise faith and pursue God, it is extremely difficult to not bypass. And what bypassing is, is pursuing a vain imagination at the expense of looking in front of you at the hardest thing that you're facing right now. It looks exactly what you just said. And let me give you some examples. So like, have all of us right now, if we're like going to a private room and sit with ourselves in quietness and just really sit with yourself, you're going to know and you might have to encounter a lot of faith, a lot of fear and distortion and anxiety and trauma to the eating problems, <laughs> and all of these things that we just are entangled with, right? And bypassing is trying to like ignore or escape the reality of what's there in front of you. So you, you go after a big spiritual thing, and it's a way for you to ignore what's in front of you. And this is how we exercise faith, vain faith. So you're exercising faith in a God that you like because that God keeps you from doing the hard thing in front of you. And this is why we go back to justification, because justification is the idea that you don't get to do that anymore. And that is, is you've got to sit in your fear and in your pain and in your trauma and in your healing and all the things that you're untangling. That is always the task at hand. It's always the task. To sit in that and to not bypass what's in front of you. So if you want to get your calling election made sure, stop bypassing. If you want to be born again, Stop bypassing. If you want this blessing and that blessing and this and that, and I want to like, I want to prepare for the destructions coming, and I want to do this. Stop bypassing. It's the only thing you have really to do. What fears are you entangled with? What are you not doing that you should? What relationships are not being healed with? What poison are you holding on to? What forgiveness are you not getting rid of? Are you doing? And I'm not being flippant about this, because I know this is hard stuff. I mean, you mentioned that your husband's in heaven. I mean, I know this is hard, incredibly hard things. Stress me, you've gone through divorces and children losses and horrible things, like very, very hard things that sometimes 
we can use the, the best intended things can become false gods to us because they enable us to bypass what's in front of us. And you've got to stop. It's the, it's the way, if you want to move forward, stop bypassing. You have to look at what's right here with you right now and work on it and bring it to God and go through the healing or the repentance or whatever it is to get that into its face or release it or go through it. Okay, so this, this is really what we wanted, I wanted to drive at towards the end. So faith, use your faith. Even though Joseph's giving you this grand arc that like at the end of this thing, what makes you saved, this is radical, is that you actually know God and you know God because you are just like him. And until you're in that position, you're not saved. He says it. Don't think that you can get in the vehicle and as long as I do my best 1% every day, that vehicle gives me the celestial kingdom. It's a false God. It's a false thing. It's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. The way, what works is exercising faith and not bypass. Now, if you do that, are, is it going to lead you to the ordinances? Yeah. Not say, we're not invalidating anything here. We're just going to do it for the right reason and for the right purpose. You still go to the ordinances. You still, you still are driving towards your calling and election made sure. But it all, it all, it's all contained right here. What am I bypassing? What am I what am I what am I trying to avoid? What painful thing is sitting in me that if I read Visions of Glory enough and I think that I'm gonna be the guy marching to Missouri will give me hope enough to live in this world and I can avoid all the crap I'm ignoring. Or if I can lose myself in the divine feminine, or I can lose myself in going to the temple every day and June genealogy work, or I don't need to like seek those things, I just need to serve in holy and higher and holier ways every day. Full crap. You're all full of crap. Are those things good? Yes. They're good, but they're also massive false gods. No one's a, no, Mark and I are probably on this earth the two biggest defenders of Tom Harrison in Visions of Glory. We'll go, we'll die for that guy. Is that one of the biggest bypassing books ever created? Heck yeah. It, like people will read it and it, it's it's awakened so many people to faith. And these, and these, these agents of the adversary are going after it in a way that's so despicable. And they're agents of faith. They're those who love a lie and make a lie who are going after Tom Harrison. They love a lie and they make a lie. But don't get lost in the temptation that you can read Visions of Glory and it enables you to feel like, oh, I felt the spirit in this, therefore I must be the 144,000. I'm going to be the one that gets to go to the light city, or I'm going to get called out on the track. And I better just start building up my food storage and building up, you know what I mean? Like, you can, this can become a false god in two seconds. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So what is Tom going through? What is he not bypassing? To reach oh. what, what you see. It's yeah. not an easy track. It's horrible. It strips you of everything. If Tom were sitting right here, I, I think in confidence that both Mark and I could say, that Tom would say, yeah, like, work on yourself in the sense of, like, repent. Like, we've heard him say, people say, hey, Tom, how do you, how do you uh, um, prep for the, for the end time? And he's like, uh, get a pair of boots, get all the food stores the church asks you, like, fulfill all the all the requests, they tell you, it's like, you're going to go give that to the church anyway. Like, it's going to go to the stakes and then they're going to, you know, it's great. Do it. And then repent. There's, no, there's nothing else you can do. You know, and like, maybe the Lord is calling you to Missouri. I'm not discounting that. Maybe he's giving you a, a, a dream and say, go to Missouri, and you do it. I'm not discounting that. But man, I know a lot of people who move to Missouri because it enables them to bypass the crap they're not contending with in front of them. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's a part of the, you know, the apocalypse means it's the revelation of all things. All things come out as, that are, all things that are hidden are released. That's what the apocalypse means. That means you, it means anything in you that's not in that alignment or healed is going to be thrust into exposure. So do you want to do it by your own free will and choice? Or do you want to do it because a mountain just landed on your house and your children? 
<laughs> right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Can I just add to what you're saying? I, I teach quite a bit, and one of the things I say to people is result my own experience. If you want to get close to God, have all the problems in your life right now that are right in front of you in partnership with God and Holy Ghost. Yeah. That will take you forward faster than anything. Yeah. You want your calling and let you make sure? Right. Go to your room, sit in your pain, and ask what is the biggest fear driver I'm contending with. Take radical responses. Yeah, take radical responses for it. Take the radical responses, taking it, looking at it, and bringing it to the Lord and, and working through it and not bypassing it. Because your spiritual journey can be the biggest vain project you ever do. And you think the whole time that you're like, you're special. Right? Does that make sense? It's not, to, I'm not invalidating vision of glory. It's just a really good case study. I'm not invalidating vision of the sort. Vision of the Lord, I think, is phenomenal. It's a testimony right. of somebody who experienced something through sacrifice. That guy sacrificed to bring that testimony forward. So, the sacrifices will be counted to him. But you can't take that witness and create a false god out of it that enables you to bypass and, and, and activate your ego, right? Does that make sense? What's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You said Reed was reading. I remember when you taught Reed President Benson's Pride Talk every year. Mm -hmm. right. I was like, oh, my gosh, I've got to do that every year. Yeah. 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 Pride Talk. Did you bring it Reed because Reed helped him write it? <laughs> What's that? You, why did you bring Oh, you said Reed it. Reed. Oh, I thought you meant Reed Benson. No, she taught oh. and said oh. that she... She makes her to help her character because she's sacrificing. You are sacrificing. Oh. So read it, you'll always see something. Read it once a year. Yeah. I think he said Reed Benson, who's his Reed son, Carter. who helped him. Oh, that's 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 read the Pride Talk every present. I got you. Okay, so all of this. I look. I, I don't want to, this, the point of this is not to invalidate. I don't want to be one of those people like you don't need to know that for your salvation. Baloney. You need to know everything for your salvation. Like that's the definition of salvation is knowing everything. Mm -hmm. So people are going like, don't criticize them, but you know you, you get in that weird false god structure. But there's false gods everywhere. That's why it's a straight and narrow path. And that straight and narrow path is a state of justification. Justification. One way of looking at that is is living in your crap and facing it head on. You need a therapist, and go get a therapist. Do you need like a gym trainer? I think we'll get one of those. Okay. Someone helped me uh, years ago in thinking as a parent. Um, I would draw a line down the front page and put justified by the spirit or self-justified. And, mm -hmm. and whenever you can distinguish, is the spirit justifying this so that I can be a just man, woman, made perfect in him? Or am I self-justified? Yeah, that's a great it. paradigm. And it's just very simple, like one line. It's a really, really, really good paradigm. I love that. That's a great. There's all these different ways of like kind of working through this question, right? <clears throat> so in conclusion, we have to manage what seem to be paradoxes. You have to have a hope and vision for your eternal possibilities. You you obtain the promises and the visions the Lord gives you, and they're real. It's not nonsense. You can have an eternal marriage. You can have world without end. You can have your calling and election made sure in this life. You can see Christ. Not only can you see Christ, you're under covenant to do it. It is salvation. It's not frosting on the cake. It's the cake. Okay? But it can be used as a bypass. And then it becomes a false religion. So your, your true religion is one hair hair length, hair width away from a false religion. You see that? Mm -hmm. Getting up and reading John Pontius books or Abraham Gileadi or Michael Rush or whoever you're into. You read Michael Rush like crazy. You think, man, you're really learning a lot and you're just bypassing. Because it's easier to read Michael Rush or John Pontius or Russell M. Nelson or General Conference than it is to sit in your crap and face it. <laughs> I, go, I can't wait for General Conference. Why? Go do it tonight this morning. Go have your <laughs> I guarantee you, you will gain more if you go in your room and you sit and you just feel what's flowing through you. 
you say, oh, that's a fear. Man, I've been holding that back for a long time. Let's bring that out. Let's draw it out. Let's give it to the Lord. That'll be better than the next ten general conferences you watch. I, I'm not trying to disparage conference just a little bit. Go ahead. All right, one more thing. Um, I met somebody at the IM conference um, named Cole, Tillman. Vinnie Tolman, yeah. Yeah, and I love how he treated the natural man as a spiritual person that, that as long as we're putting that spiritual person in the driver's seat, and uh, but but he didn't disparage the ego. He said, that's why we came here to experience the carnal side so we can learn and we can make as above so below. I mean, yeah. things like that. So, yeah. And that in, Vin, in Vinny's world, like, um, those folks bring out a lot of truth, but again, this is one of those situations, like, this is like the spiritual world. This is sort of like... Um, the Christ consciousness world. Um, that world um, is very attractive because they capture a truth perspective that gets overlooked a lot. It's really, really important. But once again, if you do not have a complete, full, true understanding of who God is, even in those structures, you'll very quickly exercise faith in a false god or a god of your own projection. Right? Like it, it's almost. Imp- yeah, ex- exactly. But we shouldn't hate ourselves for being in a carnal world. How do we transform it the way Christ did? Yeah. Mm. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, maybe you recognize the paradox here that we're driving towards the greatest spiritual possibilities given to us. At the same time, the call is to a boring Wednesday morning. Not this morning, but a boring Thursday morning. <laughs> right? Yeah, Tomorrow morning you wake up and you got yeah, kids and you got Cheerios yeah. and you got <laughs> work stress and whatever stress. There's your, there's your task. That's that's your calling. That's that's your calling. That's you know, sit in it and lean into it. And and, and um, yeah, sufficient is the day of the evil thereof. And if your eye is seen for the glory of God every morning, your, your body will be full of light. There will be no darkness. That 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 um, that person has no darkness. And they will comprehend all things. And your your spiritual expansion and your gifts and your awareness will magnify the rate. Their testimony of the gospel, and their testimony of the principle of faith and lectures of faith, which if you'll, if you'll um, visit, revisit and read like one long arc of, of a doctrine, very productive. And their testimony is in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. amen.